Hi, it's Michael from Oilers Live Podcast. Uh, my guest tonight was Eric Friesen, a uh, regular contributor at Oil on White. Uh, before you get a chance to listen, though, I'd like to talk to you about a cause uh, that means a lot to me. It is called Connected North. It's a tournament I'm playing in uh, at the beginning of April. Uh, really ask for your support uh, right now. And you can find my uh, fundraising page at support.connectednorth.org backslash Oilers Live. So again, that's support.connectednorth.org backslash Oilers Live. I don't do this show uh, to make an income. I do it because I'm a fan. Uh, if you like it, Please support this wonderful cause. Uh, it's about uh, getting collaboration tools out to some of our northern indigenous communities. And I am proudly uh, 50% uh, Cree. Um, and uh, so this means a lot to me. Uh, please, if you can, go out, support me. $5, $10, $100, whatever you can. I've got a goal of $500. Help me get there in the next 30 days. Thank you so much, and enjoy tonight's show. Welcome to Oilers Live Podcast. I've got as my guest tonight Eric Friesen. He's a contributor for Oil on White and, uh, you know, one of our uh, loyal Oiler fans that uh, I love reading his articles and um, have been excited to have him on the show. Welcome, Eric. Hey, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to uh, great to have you and great to, um, as I said before we started recording, it's just great to have a podcast after an Oilers win. <laughs> yeah, you know, it kind of would have been a sour note to record this on a boring one nothing regulation loss. So it's nice that McDavid was able to put the team on his back and pick up a 2-1 win. So we have uh, a little more positive outlook going into this thing. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's tough to find positives in another year when you're not making the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then, and then again, um, you know, you go yeah. and you watch a game and you see a guy like McDavid just take things away. Uh, it's phenomenal. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's really disappointing that <clears throat> if the Stanley Cup playoffs aren't going to include the, the best and the most exciting hockey player in the world. Uh, but hopefully we'll be uh, seeing him again in 2019 in there. But <laughs> that's we're going to get into a whole other tangent if we start talking about what the Oilers are going to have to do to make that happen. Yeah, well, we'll get, we'll get into that, <laughs> I'm sure, at some point uh, tonight. One of the things that, um, you know, I was thinking about uh, throughout the game tonight, which is, you know, was, I was actually quite excited to see uh, Barzal, Barzal play tonight. And... Um, you know, I was listening to uh, Stoffer's uh, Oilers Now uh, this afternoon, and he had mm -hmm. Louis DeBrusque on. Uh, yeah. And I'm a big fan of Louis. And, um, you know, they were talking about Barzell and just how exciting he is. And, and of course, the kids scored uh, where he's got 69 points uh, on the year. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I'm really excited about is when it seems McDavid just gets like pumped up for these games against guys like him. Uh, I sometimes I think I, <laughs> I know this is going to sound crazy, but I think I forget after every game just how good <laughs> Connor is. And then he goes and does some of the, the yeah. stuff he did tonight. I mean, uh, absolutely phenomenal. Well, first, I mean, I heard some of that too. And, you know, Louis knows that draft class probably as good as anyone. I mean, of course, his son Jake was in that. He was at the draft. And I'm, I'm sure he got to scout uh, Barzell pretty well from watching his son play against him for a couple of years in the Dubs. So, yeah, that was interesting. And, yeah, like you say, you almost... I'm almost getting used to how spectacular Connor is. Like the first season, even season and a half, it's like, wow, like I've never seen a guy do some of these things. And now it's like commonplace almost like you, you pretty much expect this level of greatness every time he steps to the ice. But you're right. Like, I mean, he just gets bounces that no one else gets like the Tampa Bay goal where, you know, the four in the Tampa Bay game where he puts a harmless looking <laughs> puck out of the corner, deflects off a stick. And then the Tampa Bay player, I'm forgetting who it was at the time, but kicks it into his own net. And then uh, tonight, you know, banks it off a stick and off the goalie's mask. And then like, 
he sometimes you just have to be lucky to be good and <laughs> he he sure uh he sure gets those bounces more than uh than a lot of other guys and how many minutes can this guy play in overtime i mean he uh the one that the one game that amazed me was that calgary game mm-hmm. where i think he played uh just about four minutes uh in overtime uh but he played pretty much the majority tonight i mean he's on you get he gets a little 30 second breather but then he's back well, on I mean, I mean this is phenomenal. only the third season i believe that they've had the three on three overtime in <clears throat> and the first year i think everyone was still kind of trying to figure it out like coaches were, were trying to decide okay how many different forward pairs are we gonna have for this and you know todd mcclellan experimented with that i think his first couple years now it's pretty much connor and leon are one pair and then probably Nuge and someone else, Kajula or Aber, you know, whoever can go out there just for or Strom even, I guess tonight, uh, two guys who can go out there and, you know, hold the fort down until 97 and 29 are able to rest their lungs for 30 seconds and hot back out. Yeah. And, you know, they're so well conditioned, these guys, <laughs> and they're young. They have the young legs. I mean, they can toss them right back out there. But yeah, I think anytime we get to overtime in three and three, you're going to see Connor play. If it goes the full five minutes, uh, he's going to play probably at least three of those, I would think. Yeah. And I, I get to this point where, you know, I want the Oilers to win in regulation, but then a part of me is not at all upset if we go into overtime because yeah. just watching him tonight when he, you know, when he grabbed the puck and uh, split the split the D on a three on three and, um, you know, I mean, he had, uh, well, mm-hmm. he had, I think, three or four, what I would say are quality chances in overtime. Uh, yeah, it's just unreal. Oh yeah, I mean, we like we were talking before the podcast, uh, the way that he's just able to, you know, make spectacular play after spectacular play, it's incredible and uh kind of lost my train of thought there. But yeah, he's uh <laughs> anytime we get to see him in overtime it's special. Uh you look at we were you were mentioning before about the regulation uh wins i mean yeah it would be that's yeah. what i was thinking of it, it'd be great to see them close out a few more teams in the the 60 minutes but you know there's no real incentive to do that either because if it comes down to playoff tiebreakers they got that new regulation plus overtime wins category right yeah and as long as they don't go to the shootout i mean there's there's no real incentive for them to push to win it in regulation unless they ever bring in a, a you know a three-point regulation win uh but the, honestly in overtime, those guys know that they're going to win more than they're going to lose. So if it's close, if, if it's tied 3-3 with a minute and a half to go, they're probably going to just try and lock this down. You know, let's let's make the safe play, guarantee the, the overtime point just for getting there, and then we'll take care of business and probably win this in the extra frame. Yeah, just close it up. So let's uh, let's chat about. Uh, I mean, because we could probably, uh, I could probably do a whole series of episodes about how great Connor McDavid is. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but let's chat about some of the other players tonight. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as we get into the end of the season, uh, you know the you know the common phrase that that we're used to hearing at this time of year is garbage time. Uh, what, um, what's your thoughts tonight on, on some of the players? Uh, one of the players that, uh, I'd like to know what you thought about, uh, was Aberg. Uh, what'd you think of his game tonight? I thought that this was probably his most noticeable other than the first one in uh, San Jose where he had the really nice assist to Pooley Arvey. If you think about it, he, he didn't really stand out overly that night, but he made the one play that, uh, you know, caught a lot of people's attention. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's maybe one of the two shifts that I noticed him that night. But it was, uh, you know, he made a really great pass and PRV was able to cash it. And tonight, I liked how he was skating and holding, controlling the puck. You know, there's a couple of times where he maintained good posi- possession in the, the offensive zone. So I, uh, I think that there's a player there. I'm not sure it's a top six player he might be kind of like a middle six guy you know uh, probably a player who's better suited for the third line but can play the second line in a pinch and they got a guy who's you know got some speed and he seems to have pretty good vision i uh, i think that that was a decent trade for the oilers you know shirelli gets a lot of a lot of crap for uh, a lot of his deals but i think that that might turn out to be one of his better ones especially if letestu possibly comes back in the off season which you know isn't set in stone but you know there's there's a possibility that they explore that avenue too 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and my thought on Aberg tonight was, uh, you know, not unlike yours. I I looked at him. There's a guy that he's not, you know, a, a skill player that um, necessarily makes the the pretty plays into the middle or anything like that. But what I actually noticed yeah. about him tonight was when he was battling, he had you know really good compete, and uh, he might be the kind of guy that's in and out of the lineup you know, depending. Right. But, um, but I really admired him tonight that he, um, he just kind of kept going and, uh, he made, he made some bad moves tonight. I mean, he wasn't perfect. You don't expect that of a middle six guy. Um, but you, you do expect that they're working hard and, and that's what I admired about him tonight. And that's another thing that we kind of heard about him when he was coming, that he had a pretty good compete level. And honestly, on, on a team like this, that, you know, some people have questioned their work ethic at times this year, Having a guy who is going to work hard for everything, who's still trying to make his name in the NHL, I think he's played just over 50 NHL games. Uh, I'd, ha- I'd have to check yeah. that. But, I mean, look, he played 12-26 tonight. That's decent minutes for uh, for a guy of his caliber. And I think that Oilers fans are going to grow to like this guy. Can he be a 12-15 to 15 goal scorer next season? I think that that is a realistic uh, goal total for him. I don't think we should be expecting too much more than that. But 15 goal scores are valuable. I mean, if you can get a couple of those guys on your third line, you know, you're looking good. Uh, I mean, honestly, not to get too far off topic, but look at Jujar Kara. I mean, I think he's kind of exceeded yeah. everyone's expectations. He looks like a guy who might be able to score 20 at some point in his career. Well, we, and, and that's not off topic because uh, Kara, of course, uh, tonight came to uh, the the defense of uh, Pacarin and yes. uh, Clutterbuck that was, uh, you know, as dirty a play as you could see. Oh, um, Kara rude. just uh, pounded on him. Uh, you know, I've I've just been a big fan of Kara this um, sort of the second half of the season. The first half, I mean, he wasn't he wasn't uh, terrible. He just wasn't as noticeable as he's been uh, kind of this last half of the season here. Uh, what's your thoughts on him tonight? Yeah, I, well, I mean, that was definitely his uh, his most noticeable uh, play tonight, and he's been playing really good as of late. Uh, Tonight, I, I think he held his own. Uh, I'd have to check what he played for minutes here. Uh, okay, so he played 13.49. Yeah, he was getting a pretty regular shift then, too. Uh, honestly, like I love that this guy stands up for uh, his teammates, though. I remember a couple years ago, I think it was his first fight was against Brendan Dillon. And in, was it 14.15 yep. or 15.60? It might have been 15.60. Anyway, uh, he... Uh, he held his own really in that fight and we're like, okay, like, you know, this, he's a big guy, but we found out that he could chuck him a little bit too. And really uh, he, out of all the fights that he's had the past couple of years, I can't think of too many that he's lost. He might've had a couple ties in there, but he's coming out on the better end of those scraps than, than uh, most other ones. Right. So having, having another guy like that who can fight, but also has, you know, some underlying skill. I mean, we saw how great his shot was. Uh, You look at some of his goals this year. He's, he had a, a sweet goal in Winnipeg earlier this year right from the slot. I don't remember that one. And then he scored an almost identical (laughs) goal in LA uh, about a month ago. Like this guy, this guy can play. He's not just a, your typical fourth line enforcer, which I know are sort of being washed out of the game at this point, but this is a guy who can fight when he has to, but he can play a regular shift. And that's the kind of guy the Oilers need. And, and you know what, for a big guy who's, what is he? Six foot four, six foot three, 220, five pounds i mean he gets up the ice you know he's not slow yeah no he uh he's got sneaky speed for sure and uh he protects yeah. the puck uh as well as anybody and um you know he just continues to get better what a right? contract too yeah I mean, the goalers have him for another year after this on a really good track i think six hundred and seventy five thousand a year i think he's getting paid and yeah that's that's a bargain deal and i was really glad that vegas didn't pick him up uh last summer i thought that that was for sure going to be the guy that they were going to take and when they took griffin reinhardt not to <laughs> not to bring up uh, the matt barzell thing again but it, but uh <laughs> yeah. when they took uh, griffin reinhardt al- although there were a lot of people who were sour about that because it's like oh the guy that we wasted a first and a second on gone for for nothing um 
yeah, Jujar Kara, I, I was pretty glad that they were able to hold on to him. And yeah, he's a he's a player that I think can can be a productive piece of this team for the next five years. Yeah. So you know, and, and just on the Jujar Kara thing, and and maybe off to stay on the um, on the game for a minute. Yeah. You wrote a um, an article for Oil on White uh, about two three days ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, espousing uh, Nugent Hopkins on the wing, Connor McDavid's wing. Uh, you're not the first one to suggest that, and no, you certainly definitely. won't be the last one. Um, I think uh, if you went by the amount of minutes that we waited uh, to see that, uh, you'd be in the thousands of minutes. <laughs> we saw it at, uh, I remarked it at 15.54 of the third period uh, tonight. Or 1554 left, I should say, uh, of the third period. We saw it for about a 30 second shift. And then we saw it again uh, a few minutes later with uh, Jujar and, uh, and Nugent Hopkins. We didn't see enough. But um, <laughs> I mean, was it was this uh, McClellan um, and, uh, you know, I, this will get an explicit rating, but is this him telling the rest of us to fuck off about it already? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I, th- I mean, I think that he was just mixing up his lines as Todd's known to do. Uh, how long have we heard that Nugent Hopkins is this Joe Pavelski type player from Todd McClellan. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big Todd McClellan fan, despite how much uh, hate that he's been getting as of late for not utilizing his players in the best possible roles. I really want to see the Oilers use Nugent Hopkins in a Joe Pavelski type role where he can play center, he can play wing, you know, he can he can be down on a third line centering when he has to. He can also play a top line role with uh, Connor McDavid. And he's smart enough to play with McDavid and not not only that, he's got a great shot. Both of them can shoot. I know that they're past first guys. But they can finish plays. Uh, look at Nuge. He's got 17 goals and he already, and he missed uh, just under a quarter of the season. Yeah, 25 games. Mc, McDavid has started to show this year that he is a sharpshooter and that, you know, he's this, he's going to score over 30 goals for the rest of his career, as far as I'm concerned. And there's going to be some 40 plus goal seasons in there. Uh, as soon as he decides that he wants to be that type of player and that he wants to score more goals, he will. It's it's like my dad my dad and I were talking a while ago and he was saying, you know, everyone used to tell Gretzky to shoot more in the eighties. <laughs> and and then he started to shoot more and then he started scoring 70, 80, 90 goals a season. So I mean, different era, uh different expectations for goal totals, but the kind of the message is the same thing. Like if Connor decides that he really wants to be an elite goal scorer, he will because his talents are just so superior. And I would not be surprised if he scores 50 sometime in his career. Uh, But Nugent Hopkins should definitely be playing with him. There are going to be those who argue, you know, he should be down the middle. He's got so much smarts and uh, reliability in the defensive end that, you know, that's the kind of guy you want playing center and i'm not saying that he should always be exclusively on the wing but for a team like edmonton that is really lacking skill on the wing right now and a team that has the luxury of five quality nhl centers mcdavid dry strom uh kara and uh whom whom i'm uh, missing one right now oh and nuge of course so yeah so yeah. yeah so you got so you got those guys you have the the luxury of being able to move Nuge to the wing. At least try it. Honestly, I would be disappointed if they traded him for Mike Hoffman in the summer without at least seeing if there is some level of comfort and chemistry playing with McDavid because we don't know if Mike Hoffman's going to have chemistry with Connor. I think you're just you're taking a shot at it, right? But I would rather trade I would rather keep 24-year-old Nugent Hopkins than trade him for 27 year old Mike Hoffman when we we don't know if you know we've seen the best of him I'm not saying that he won't score you know in the high 20s or hit 30 again but yeah. we don't we don't know if if he's kind of peaked because a lot of players kind of have reached their 
uh, top goal production by that point. I would rather keep Nuge because of the position he plays and because of his skill set. And we don't want to be sitting here a year from now saying, oh man, we surely blew a, another trade. We just gave away Nuge for Hoffman and he's completely done nothing at Edmonton. So, I, and look, the trade could happen tomorrow and Hoffman could come in and be great. But if if that's the deal or if it's for Tyson Berry or whoever, I would still just like to see first if Connor and Nuge can create some magic because we know that he and Dreisaitl can, but let's see what Let's see what uh, Nuge can do with Connor first. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, if we look back at the successes we've had this year, uh, Connor and, and Dreisaitl have been playing on separate lines, right? I mean, they together are successful. There's no doubt about that. But as a team success, uh, when we're playing those guys on, on separate lines, because uh, Dreisaitl is, you know, whether uh, he, you know, he started slow, maybe it was the pressure of the big contract or whatever, but he has really proven himself mm-hmm. to be an elite player uh, in this last part of the season. And, I, and uh, he can drive his own line oh, and he's confident enough now to do it. 100%. And I think that the concussion early in the, in the year set him back a little bit too. Mm-hmm. That can have effects that last for weeks or even months. And I never really got the whole thing about people saying that Dreisaitl was having a bad year. There was a point, there was a point where they were talking about him on the panel on Hockey Night in Canada that he was having a bad year. And he had played, I think, the same amount of games as Austin Matthews and had two more points. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, the guys at, at this time, he had about, I think it was 52 points in 54 games. And I'm just thinking, how is, Dreisaitl having a bad year. He's almost a point per game player. I know he's making eight and a half million dollars, but what more do you want from the guy? Does does he have to score ninety points to justify that contract? If he's a point per game player or close to it for the for the duration of that contract, I think that he's worth it. Yes, he's probably a little overpaid, but I would rather pay for a guy who's coming into his prime than paying for a guy who's going out of his prime like Lucic is. Those eight years of dry sidle coming up, well, we're in the first one right now, but those next seven years are going to be the best seven years of his career. And he's going to be an elite two way force who's six foot two and 215 pounds. Those players don't grow on trees. Like, ask the Montreal Canadiens. They've, they've been trying to find a guy like dry sidle for 25 years. And uh, that's just one example. He would be a first line center on so many other teams in this league. We're lucky to have him as the second line center. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And he, um, and the other thing you got to keep in mind is, uh, it's only seven of those points that he's had this year from the power play. Yeah. Uh, which is it's, to me is phenomenal, <laughs> right? Like usually a guy like that, that's getting close to a point a game. Uh, there's a great deal more like 15, 16 points by now would be power play points, but we certainly haven't had that luxury. No, if the Oilers are ever able to figure out that power play and get it clicking where it should be, <laughs> Connor is going to get 120 points and dry side will probably be at 90 if they can ever figure that out. And hope that that is something that they address in the off season, whether it be bringing in someone new to run the power play other than Jay Woodcroft or just getting a natural shooter on there like Pooley Arvey or whoever they try to bring in. Uh, but they're, they need to figure that out because it is just killing their season. I mean, at this point, it has killed their season, but uh, that that is something that needs to be addressed next year if they're going to be back in the playoff race. Yeah, the power play is uh, of the utmost. Well, special teams in general. I mean, obviously the uh, uh, the PKs looked up as of late, but um, it's got to be consistently uh, good, and um, and we just haven't had that. But they've made some changes there, which is nice yeah. to see. Uh, that's good. Let's um, chat about because um, the other part of that uh, tonight, having Nugent Hopkins on the wing with mm-hmm. McDavid, was uh, Jujar uh, playing left. What did you think of that? Well, he's a guy that can move around. I still think that they want to try him as a center long term. And if he can be that big body down the middle who can take face-offs and uh, be, a, be a guy that they can count on in that role. And 
maybe drive a fourth line or play up on a third line if he if he needs to. That's where I think they'd ideally like to have him. So I'm baiting you on the other topic, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? But- which is which is Lucic on the wing. Uh, you know, tonight I would say he was uh, responsible for not getting the puck out on the <laughs> Islanders' goal. I see what uh, you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he was uh, he of course missed the uh, beauty off of. Now, I'm not I'm not in the uh, hate Lucic bandwagon. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean I, I like this guy. We all know the contract stance. He's a good. He's a good guy. You know, he's a decent NHL player who's making exactly who's making way too much money. This is. This is Sean Horkoff all over again, but to a new level. <laughs> yeah. So let's, you know, for this discussion, let's take the contract out of it. Okay. Let me, let's, you know, you look, you, you can tell the look on his face, the frustration this guy is having. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Eric, we, we haven't had a chance to chat. I don't know if you're a hockey player, but if you're a hockey player, mm-hmm. uh, I play hockey. I play, typically I play defense. Okay. When I go up and I play forward, which I will on occasion, uh, and I, there's one team I play on that's uh, a number of skilled players, and I'll go and play forward. Uh, you know what's frustrating for me is when I can't help my line mates because I got, I got defensemen's hands around the net, right? Okay. Uh, so when I can't help my line, line mates on a beauty pass, you know, whether it's back door or, or you know, I get the puck right in front yeah. of the net and I can't put, put the puck in, uh, mm-hmm. I feel, I don't even feel just bad about my own lack of production, but I feel bad because I've cost, you know, my line mates a point. Yeah. I think tonight when you see him skate off after he missed that uh, little pass from Drysidel, that's the look I yeah, saw. That that probably is pretty accurate. And, and I do play. Uh, if I had to compare myself to someone, I would say I am kind of like a Jordan Everly type. I, not not really a hard shot. I, I was a goal scoring winger and uh, not the most defensively reliable. <laughs> so yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, that's so, pretty accurate. Don't ever yeah, like so them, anytime right? I. Anytime Anytime I used to hear criticisms about Everly in uh, in the Edmonton media, it's like hmm, these are like these are like the critiques that I would get uh, from my dad on drives home uh, growing up. So, I'm like, I'm like I'm heard, I, I, I feel like I've heard this message somewhere before, but uh, but yeah, I know what you mean. And look, it didn't cost them tonight. Uh, he needs to do some things in the off season to correct himself. Like he needs to change his body composition. He's listed at 236 pounds right now. He's got to get down to at least 225 and really work with a skating coach in the off season to pick up at least half a step of extra pace to his game. Because right now he's just getting so lost in the game. He can't keep up with the play. Uh, it's dying on his stick whenever he gets the puck and yeah, it's it, it's just been a a year to forget for him. Hopefully, he can just wipe this one from the memory bank, make the necessary changes in the off season, and come back a, a rejuvenated player next year. So I think we agree he's not going anywhere. I mean, here's a guy with a no, no. movement clause, and and the odds of trading him are are, are well, pretty slim. So you know uh, he can list five teams after. Sorry, he can list ten teams after five years. Yeah, yeah, and, and so. It, in the summer of what would that be 2021 he can list 10 teams he'd be willing to go to so i i'll i'm not 100 percent sure that he's going to spend the full seven years in edmonton in fact i doubt that he will even if the oilers have to eat some uh money on that contract i think they'd be willing to do that but i would i'd bet that he's uh he's going to be traded before it's done that being said we've got him for at least the next three years i i don't see him going anywhere yeah and so you know my my thought on him is you know and i i I don't disagree right like if he in the off season he you know loses a few pounds although if you the word from um, McClellan is he's he doesn't have anything to lose mm-hmm. uh, we'll see I mean who knows what happens in the off season I think what's most disappointing to me is you know he like is just this uh, like insistence that we play him on the top line I know like is it the is it the six million dollars is that what puts him there because if it is I think we got to forget that right yeah. if I'm you know if you're the coach I think you got to forget that he's being paid top line dollars and just say let's use him where we use him he's a valuable player to a team I mean he's and and you talk about compete 
that guy hates to lose just like anybody. Like he doesn't, he doesn't want to be in the slump that he's in. He doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't feel good about it. And he knows better than anybody that he needs to pick it up. And there's no doubt, I think, in my mind, that he goes into the off season and does what he needs to do, whether he'll still be, whether he'll ever be good enough to be on that top line to me yeah. is debatable. And I'm wondering, we need to, you know, maybe find somebody to go, you know, play the left wing, maybe re-sign Maroon. I don't know uh, what, what happens in the off season. Well, he's talked about, you know, like that was so encouraging to hear him say that he wanted to circle back in the off season. So, you know, there's, there's a potential there, but at the same time, if we bringing back, if we bring back Maroon, is that sending the right message to the team that, you know, this is, this is as good as it gets. Like, I, I know he's loved in the city. I love the guy too. But I think that they should be trying to look for some quicker, skilled players who can play on the wing. Because you bring in a guy like Maroon again, and now you got two really big bodies. It, yeah, he, I mean, Maroon might be able to score 20 goals again, but I would try and find a guy who can give you that same type of goal production, but also be a little bit quicker boots that can get up the ice. You know, that's, that's one of my concerns is that we just come back with the same team and expect different results. I think that there need to be bigger changes than that. Yeah. And, uh, I, I agree. I, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a fan of Maroon. I mean, he, as an individual, oh, the, guy is, the guy is, uh, he's a hell of a player and, and, you know, I'm happy he's, he's doing well in New Jersey, it. uh, right yeah. now. Uh, good to see a guy like that do well, but yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah. That's a good time for a uh, quick break and, uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Oilers Live Podcast. I've got as my guest tonight, Eric Friesen. He's a regular contributor over at Oil on White. Uh, good, uh, good first half of the podcast, uh, Eric. As we said before, always great to um, record after a uh, Oilers win. Uh, let's chat. Um, you know, we talked uh, quite a bit about the game uh, first half. Let's chat a little bit about the Oilers. And, uh, you know, we know, um, of course, the playoffs are not within reach uh, this year. Uh, maybe not mathematically, but realistically. Um and, uh, you know, one of the things I uh, tweeted out about uh, last night was, you know, the developmental prospects of our team, uh, what, uh, how we've um, treated our players in the past in terms of, you know, patience and, uh, and what we're going to do with future prospects. Uh, you know, let's, um, let's start there. What... Um, What's your thought in terms of how we've done, how we've built this team from a developmental standpoint? Well, of all the things that Shirelli gets just absolutely destroyed for by Oilers fans, I think drafting and developing shouldn't be one of them. Yes, there have been some some misses, but the misses that he've had that he's had are normally ones that he traded away. The picks that he's kept, you know, he's got a pretty good record. I mean, look at the Boston Bruins right now. Some of those picks that he drafted four or five years ago are really starting to come into the team and, you know, make an impact there. And I think that that's going to be something that the Oilers are going to be able to capitalize on too. And right now he's been here for three drafts. And I think that each of those three drafts offers uh, some prospects that I'm excited about. Uh, you look at the 2015 one. Yes, they threw away a first, uh, a second first round pick in a very deep draft that turned out to be Matt Barzal. And they gave up a, a second round pick too. Uh, it would have been great if they could have kept that second and drafted a guy like Sebastian Ajo. But honestly, you look at their later round picks, Caleb Jones in the fourth round, Ethan Bear in the fifth round, even John Marino in the sixth round, there's pretty good reports out about him. I think that that is going to be a, a pretty strong draft for the Oilers. I, I consider Jones and Bear, you know, two of their top five prospects right now. And then look at last year, or 2016, Tyler Benson, I probably would have taken uh, Alex Debrinkit with that pick. That's who I wanted them to take in the second round. A player who was just 
tailor made for Connor McDavid, but yeah. Benson Benson looks like he's going to be a good pick. M- might even have top six yeah. potential. I like Dylan Wells as a goalie. The rest there, there's some more. Uh, well, rassonen has been good too. I think. Yeah, yeah. rassonen has been good. He, he's a little more of a yeah. long shot, but I think that he's you know he's got some ability. And then last year, I think they had the best draft out of all the Canadian teams last year. I I like all of those picks. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that we're really starting to see, uh, you know, those guys take a step forward in junior. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we if you look at his uh, draft history, he didn't have much to deal with in terms of how many draft picks he had in 2015. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, his own fault. Um, but um, Jones and Bear, we saw Bear, we've seen Bear the last few games. Uh, he's been, uh, he's been outstanding. Uh, like in terms of, and I want to preface that with, uh, and, and that's part of our discussion maybe right now, but, um, I don't think he's ready to stay on the team, uh, for next year. Right. But, um, certainly, uh, he's looked like, you know, he's developing well. Uh, it'd be interesting to see, uh, Jones, uh, when he comes and, and plays a few games, um, you know, Tyler Benson's uh, been uh, player of the week in the WHL uh, two or three times this year, I think, at least twice that I know of. Yeah. Uh, going after Yamamoto, what, I know it's a first round pick and that's, you know, you shouldn't, you should never be uh, too upset about your first round picks. Uh, but Yamamoto was a bit of a hmm. surprise. I think he was the smallest player ever drafted in the first round. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, and you know he made it. Uh, you know he, it, you can debate it all you want, but he had nine, you know, nine games, and we had a good look at him. And if we develop him properly, uh, he should be great. And sorry, you go ahead. I mean, uh, talk about what he's doing right now. <laughs> it's been great watching him. He was dominant in training camp. I mean, that was their best winger and yeah i think there was definitely a bit of a letdown like after that four point game in his first game back to, with the spokane chiefs i think he only had was it eight points over his next 12 games or something like that and you, that's not what you'd expect from a guy who just finished sixth in whl scoring the year before and a guy who is supposed to be the star player on this spokane chiefs team but since coming back from the World Juniors, he's been absolutely unreal. And this is a player that I think has a chance to make the Oilers next year. It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if he ended up spending some time in Bakersfield. Uh, I think that it's important that the Oilers go out and address their situation on the wings and make it hard for him to earn a spot in training camp next year. Don't just give him a free pass that he can make the team. But yeah, he's a guy that's going to, uh, be pushing for a job. Benson, I really like Benson too. I think that he's gonna he's gonna have to spend some time yeah. in uh, in the AHL, and that's where he should be. That's a guy who I could see spending the next two seasons, at least one full season, but probably two seasons, and then he'll come up. But yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of guys to like in that draft. I mean, Max is quickly becoming one of my favorite prospects. Safin recently got signed. I'm sure we're gonna see Max Mob shortly too, and you know, I'm even hearing good things about Philip Kemp. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 a pretty good draft overall, I'd say. Yeah, Kemp's been great, and and uh, of course we've got um, you know we should be uh, picking relatively high in the upcoming uh, upcoming mm-hmm. draft. Um, so you know we've got whatever player that ends up being. Uh, if it's not Dolan, I'm I'm keeping my fingers crossed for Kachuk, uh, but. Um, you know, I mean, the you said something just now, which um, every now and again, somebody says something and I'm like, why didn't that really, you know, why didn't I think about that? And and that's um, we need to make it hard for Yamamoto to to make the team next year. And I'm not the first person who suggested that either. I, yeah. I kind of want to take credit for that. I'm pretty sure I've heard Ryan Rashog say that on Dustin Nielsen's show in the morning. 
but uh, but yeah, it's true. Like they have to bring in guys. Yeah, and that's and that's key. So you know, if you go to my uh, tweet at Oilers Live and you look at uh, and you look at that from last night, I know you and I talked a little bit about it. You you saw it. There was yeah. a, a good healthy discussion. One of the things though that I you know I I um, and and maybe I should read it out uh, for those that uh, didn't see it. But basically, I you know I I was talking about how some teams year over year they don't bring in players uh typically that are under 22 23 and uh you know i was espousing a little bit of patience uh from the people i was discussing and i basically said you know next year do we give yamamoto yamamoto a shot do we give uh ethan bear a shot uh what about maximov if he's you know if he looks good and um and or do we you know put them uh, in bakersfield i think uh sean uh oilnight.ca he uh he said uh, which i think he's right is maximov's not eligible for ahl next year um, no because he only turns 19 uh this summer yeah so he, he'd be back uh, obviously playing junior if um yeah. if we put him there but what's your thought i mean this is something that we have not we've as fans we don't want to have patience with because year over year we just you know 11 out of 12 years missing the playoffs you know we want to see the best guys right yeah uh we want to see yamamoto i mean i'd be lying to you if i didn't tell you that i was hoping he'd make the team this year you know i mean yeah, you know, that's I a little wanted, guy skilled <laughs> i think we all I wanted were, him right? i wanted him back in junior honestly i was happy for the kid that he made the team but i didn't think he would stick past the nine games but no i'm really excited about his future you know it looks awfully bright at this point and He's got just loads of talent, and I think that he's got the smarts and the speed to play with a Leon Dreisaitl or a Connor McDavid. So I see him as, as a top six winger eventually. And he's a right shot, which is also a, a huge asset for him. But Maximov, like, man, that's going to be a guy who's going to, you know, be pushing in a few years too. Like, yes, he, he should go back to the OHL again next year. He was dominating early in the year. He's kind of slowed down a bit down the stretch. But really, he was scoring, he was averaging almost a goal a game for over a month there. And he was a top five goal scorer in the OHL at one point, and he was the only 18-year-old in that group. It's it's kind of great because last year, yeah. everything changed after his trade uh, to Niagara. And if you think about it, he was 17 all of last season. This year, this is his true 18-year-old season. Yes, he's already been drafted, but he's... Be been 18 years old from start to finish because he's a June birthday. And we're really getting to see what this guy can do as an 18 year old. So I think that the potential for him is just immense because at 19, he's going to come in a year older, a year more experienced. And I think he's going to have a chance to put up 50 goals in the OHL next year. Uh, Sean would probably have a better idea than me uh, on that because he knows the OHL better than anyone. But uh, Maximov is a player that I'm really excited about. And then I think if he goes to Bakersfield for a year after that, add some skill down there, which they desperately need. And then after that comes up from the farm, I think that he's going to be a guy who uh, is going to be a real contributor for this Oiler team in a second or third line role who can give you some offense. He's got a great shot. Great shot. Well, and, and Sean's talked uh, a fair bit about him. He's a big fan of Maximov, as, as am I. Uh, you know, and I first, I really sort of started to follow him, too, uh, because of Sean talking about him uh, at the oilnight.ca. Uh, one of the things that, um, you know, he he had said and, and one of the things that i like about this this kid now is is he's not just putting up points right like he's got um looking at his stats he's got 70 points in 57 games he's also got 68 uh 68 well pims. he was suspended for four uh, games in january too yeah he was suspended for four games and and i don't mind that i mean here's a kid that's you know starting to play with a little bit of a chip and um you know my understanding is uh, sean's gone out to uh, watch mm -hmm. him play once or twice live uh he's you know on and off the ice uh, first and last uh, you know he's showing a good work ethic kind of all of the things that you want if you don't rush a player like this He's the kind of guy that surprises you two, three years down the road, and everybody says, "Where did he come from?" Uh, you know, a good fifth round uh, pick. I think he's uh, a steal in the fifth round. Yeah, absolutely. 
I mean, kind of off topic, but somewhat related. How much do you think Russia is regretting not taking him to the World Juniors this year? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. He'll be there next year. He'll be there next year. I'll tell you that. Yeah, because I, I I would be surprised if he um, you know makes the team, but we may we may see him for uh, you know two three games uh, in the NHL. Uh, next year uh the other guy what about uh smorkov have you um have you uh had a chance to see any of his highlights or um oh yeah i watch i watch his highlights a lot um there's a there's a twitter account who tweets out all the oilers prospects yeah ed uh ed and, prospects yeah i love yeah, that account he's, he's great yeah that's one of my favorite accounts and uh he he writes really good reviews on all the prospects too, which uh, is really interesting to read. Um, I think this is a guy who got third uh, third pairing potential down the road. He's he's going to take a little longer to get there than I think a guy like Maximov will. But you know the Oilers stepped up and got him in the third round last year, and that's a, another player that uh, they can build around. And it's good to have you know some more of these tall, lanky you know, defenseman who can move the puck. And once he fills out that body, he's, uh, he's going to be a rock back there. I think Now you're a Saskatoon guy. Let's not uh, talk young guys. Let's talk about a guy that was playing for the blades earlier this year. What did you think about he big? Uh, and he's yeah. not, he's not far away from you now. So I assume no. you've been out to some blades games. So uh, yeah. what's your thoughts on that? I, I haven't seen them recently. I just got back from Lloyd Minster. So I'm kind of, uh, hoping to see a few more games here down the, down the stretch. But yeah, when he got traded, to Regina, that was a that was a good move for the Blades because they needed to start stockpiling some picks and prospects from Regina, and of course the the Pats want to take a run at the Mem Cup. So I'm glad to see that an Oilers prospect is going to get to play in that again this, uh, this year, as Ethan Bear did last year. So yeah, that that should be a good experience for him. He's he's a good player, uh, but yeah, I'm I'm not as high on his NHL potential as some of the other guys, just because he is a little bit older than some of these other prospects. And, you know, he missed almost a full season a while ago and he, he's going to be, he's going to be a, a good AHL player at least. Uh, I'm going to hold out hope for the guy. I'd love to see him, you know, come through and make it in the NHL. But I would say that there's a few more question marks uh, around him than maybe, you know, a guy like, O- uh, Ostap Safin or uh, Kirill Maximov. Yeah, and of course, uh, he bigs what twenty one years old, playing in yeah. juniors. So, you know, he's uh, he's a little bit older. Uh, but I think you know, you you add a player like that if he can, um, you know, show a little bit of promise. He's the kind of guy you can uh, you can bring in in the later years, and he's also uh, potentially a good guy for you know your system, right? Uh, to have uh, in a Bakersfield uh, mm-hmm. down the road. What I've seen of him, I like him. He seems like like a, a leader on the ice um and that might be an age thing uh but you know it's good experience and um you know we've been uh, which is kind of the premise of the second half is one of the things we do uh or the oilers do rather is um is they really have been rushing players for the past 10 years uh and they've tried to get away from it a little bit but i think that temptation is just always there you know with dry sidle they rushed him and then sent him back halfway through. Uh, with with McDavid, I mean, he was going to play right away, right? I mean, some some of the like the first overall picks are all going to play right away. Yeah. Um, but then you look at other guys that, they, that have come along, like Puli Uh Once again, he got the dry sidle treatment. Came, played half a year was a healthy scratch a bunch of times, got sent down. They, it was nice that they had the luxury of sending him to the AHL, though. That was that was good that he didn't have to go play in uh, one of the junior leagues. But, yeah, now you look at Yamamoto, same thing. Like, you know, maybe they should have said, look, kid, no matter what happens in training camp, you're going back. That didn't happen. He made the team. And he played a little bit with Connor McDavid also, which probably isn't good to have Yamamoto breaking into the league playing against the other team's top defenseman every night. Uh, but this is a guy who's going to have to get used to that at some point. It's too early now for him, but he will get used to it at some point. Anyway, the point is is that they need to kind of 
slow the brakes on that. This year, they're going to have a top five pick. If they get one of the big three, which I would love them to get, uh, then that player is probably going to play right away too. But if they end up picking fourth, fifth, sixth, then get a guy like Bo Quisk, Chuck, Wallstrom, uh, Hughes, maybe that player is at least one, maybe two years away. And, and you hope that it's not two years because you want these players. Like that's the thing as fans, we want these players right now. Like you, you see, Oh man, this guy's just dominating in junior. I want to see him playing on the Oilers and doing that right now. And sometimes it's hard to be patient, but at the same time, you, you have to kind of be, because we don't want to have a situation where you rush a guy like Sam Gagne and stunt his development a little bit, uh, I think you just have to be cautioned with that one. How hard is it to be an Oilers fan and be patient at the same time? I mean, we're we're in a point right now where you know we uh, we got we we need to do something right in terms of finding some wingers. Yeah, uh, and so if we have a guy like Yamamoto come in, uh, and and I think you know whether you agree or not, I guess I I think we need you know another one or two solid D men. Uh, and you see a guy like Bear who seems to be doing all right uh, yeah. and had some and has had some uh, flashes of brilliance. He looked really great on the top power play the other night. Yeah, I mean, Todd's um, giving him opportunities. He's playing him on the power yeah. play, like you said. He got to play in overtime a little bit tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was that was great, and actually did all right. Yeah. I thought this is the time yeah. to see what he can do. Uh, he's he, you know he's probably going to be back in junior next year, but. This is a guy who is a part of the future as far as I'm concerned. So they have to take the right approach with him and do what's best for the player's potential, but also what's best for the team. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, I think though, you know, and, and I hope there's uh, some fans out there that are listening. I think the Oilers need to be, and they need to be patient. You know, uh, I think it was Chirelli and, and he probably heard it from somebody else. Uh, but the quickest way to be a fan as a GM is is to listen to the fans, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is to say, you know, if he's listening to us, uh, he won't have a job for very much I mean, uh, longer. <laughs> uh, and he might not. He might not anyway. He might not <laughs> anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. so we'll, we'll see that. But, um, you know, I hope that I think outside of the trades that he's made. Mm hmm. I actually, he's done all right with the yeah. smaller ones. He's done all right with yeah. like the, he's done all right with the smaller ones. And I like the strategy, the overall strategy of the moves that he's made and the, the, the home run yeah. trades. Are the, yeah. The, the, you know, when he goes, for, when he swings for the fence, those are the ones that end up coming back to bite him. And there's, and there, it's so hard to get past those really. Uh, but if because you, those if you team, can, it kills you. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And if you can, then the strategy I think is worthwhile waiting for, uh, which is a team that I think, you know, given the fact that we've got uh, McDavid and Dreisaitl for, you know, seven more years, right? At Together. Yeah. And then McDavid for eight, at least. Um, you know, if we were patient for, you know, next year and the year after where we're not, uh, you know, where the Oilers aren't rushing, uh, the team, uh, those players like the Yamamoto's, the Bears, and they're giving them time to develop. I think, you know, we're, we are in, you know, the next Pittsburgh Penguins organization, the next Detroit Red Wings, the next Washington Capitals. Mm -hmm. Detroit's maybe a bad example this year, but you get where I'm going, right? The Tampa Bay has a development system that, uh, um, it's exceptional. Seems, yeah. Yeah, it's exceptional, and and no surprise that Stevie Y, you know, learned from the best in Detroit. Uh, but if we if we can have that kind of patience, and um, you know, we've got something great where you know, f three four years from now, we're going to be laughing, right? Like absolutely. Yeah. But but we don't we don't necessarily want to wait that long. Here's the thing: you want to have that second wave of talent come in to help the organization. But at the same time, you still have to have players who are contributing right now. Yeah. And that's why they need to go out and get a guy like I've really been watching Jason Zucker. 
Uh, I think that, you know, he's going to want a, an increase on his $2 million that he's getting in Minnesota. That would be a guy who could come in. I would rather sign him than Patrick Maroon because this guy's been consistently scoring 20 goals the last few years, and he's going to get 30 this year. Even if you have to pay him four or five million on a five year deal, bring him in. Like that's a, that's a risk that I'd be willing to take. And that's just one example. I'm just saying I would rather do that than trade Nugent Hopkins for a Hoffman. Um, because at least then you're keeping your assets and all it's costing you is money. But the thing is Do you think uh Nuge is Nuge is gone for sure? I don't sure? think he's gone and I hope that he stays actually. Yeah. I think he's way too valuable. Unless the unless the return just knocks their socks off. But to be honest, like I'm I'm losing I'm losing some faith in Shirelli and the big moves. <laughs> don't get <laughs> yeah, me wrong, yeah. I, I, I like Adam Larson as a player. Yeah. And I think that yeah. I think that he is a fine player. And last year that trade looked like more of a win for us than it does this year because of, you know, how much he helped the team, especially in the playoffs. But, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to think about what Hall could have done. I, to me, there was something deeper there and I don't want to dive too much into that trade because, you know, that's just going to open up a whole new can of worms. <laughs> but I think that they were, they were, oh, that trade was almost like sending a message that this is Connor McDavid's team now, not Taylor Hall's team. I feel like there was, there was more to that trade than we'll ever know. Uh, but I, well, fans have a short attention yeah. span, right? I mean, there were so many people that when the trade was made, although they were questioning who we yeah. traded, nobody questioned Hall leaving, yeah. right? I, like, I mean, if, uh, I say those very absolute statements and somebody always gets upset with me on Twitter or something to, when I say nobody did, uh, but very few people but you, but you know what? <laughs> questioned Hall leaving. I went to a, I went to a game the last year that Hall played uh, for the Oilers. And it was in, it was early in the year and they lost to Washington, I think seven to four. It was one of the games right before Connor got hurt. And coming out of that arena, there were fans who are all over Taylor Hall because he had a couple bad turnovers. And you heard people saying like, oh, trade him tomorrow if we could. I, I wouldn't trade Taylor Hall for a bag of pucks. And then fast forward about seven, eight months, and those probably those same fans are just crying that, you know, we've dealt away this franchise left winger. But but like I said, beyond beyond the point at this point, but yes, they do need to acquire more skill on the wings. It's something that's hurting them. But we we need to have that second wave of talent coming in. Rashog brought that up a while ago too, that I think it's important it's important to Shirelli that when Connor McDavid is 25. There is a great support cast around him. And while I think that's great that he's looking four years down the road and saying, when he gets to that prime of his career, he's got all these excellent pieces around. I don't want to wait till Connor McDavid is 25 to start competing for the Stanley Cup. Anytime you get to the playoffs with him is a chance to win the Stanley Cup. And to quote Low Tide, the Oilers have yeah. eight bullets in the in the chamber. So you know, like uh, this is your every every year is a shot. And I think that it would be foolish of them to say, you know, next year is going to be another development year. They have to still try and push for the playoffs. They're going to have a high first round pick this year. They're going to have a high second. They got a couple thirds, but, but I think they're going to try and you know translate that into a a, a player th- via trade. But anyway, the the point is is that this is a this is a team that can't wait for Connor McDavid to get a few years older before they start to compete. The time to start competing is now. And I don't think they're that far away. They've yes, like you said, it would hurt, it would be nice to add a defenseman or possibly two and get some more skill on the wing, but I think they're deep enough down the middle and if Cam Talbot can have a bounce back year next year, they should be back in the playoffs. So what do we do about uh, somebody backing up uh, uh, Talbot? I mean, that's the one thing we're, you know, short on yeah. <laughs> right now, right? Well, I mean, yeah. they traded a they traded a fifth for Montoya, right? Or was it a fourth? A fourth for Montoya? Yeah. Um, they probably made that trade a month later than they should have. The time to make that trade was around Christmas time when they needed a goaltender when Talbot was hurt to you know keep their keep their slim playoff hopes alive. Uh, the trade didn't come in time, and then for some reason they decide that you know Brassois isn't the guy. I think that this season was kind of like illustrating that. I don't want to say that they've given up on him, but that they've kind of decided that he isn't going to be the answer right now, at least. Yeah. 
And I don't know what they do for backup because they've committed to him for next year. So do you just wave the guy and try and bring in another backup? I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, um, do you think there was ever a shot at Kemper? I, that's the one that I, uh, yeah. you know, that would have been a nice pickup, I thought. I don't know if he's going to make, um, we saw him, of course, uh, a couple nights ago. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a guy, granted, you know, playing on LA, they've got uh, uh, some defensive talent, um, but he, he had good numbers mm-hmm. in his backup role. Yeah. Uh, he went for a fourth round, I think, or, or something around that. Um, I wouldn't, uh, I round. wouldn't be opposed to that. And, you know, I knew Darcy growing up in Saskatoon and um, he's a, uh, he's a guy that I would have, you know, loved to see the Oilers uh, go out and get, but uh yeah, I I think that uh, they probably weren't thinking about him as much at the time, and maybe they should have because, you know, he's had decent results in his career, and I I would probably at this point at least take him uh, as a backup over uh, Montoya. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's not uh, Montoya's had uh, he's been you know what you expect from a backup i guess he's not been great and he's not been absolutely horrendous uh certainly he's been better than uh, uh brassois was um you know and and i feel bad for brassois right i mean you I, I think in the near the end of his uh short tenure uh, as backup um it, it came down to uh the sallow type of uh confidence right where Sometimes you know you there was not going to be any return yeah yeah yeah. And I, you know what? I was at that um, Flames game where the Flames came back. Yeah. In Calgary. Uh, and I was sitting right behind him. And, uh, oh, man, I tell you, I felt bad for the kid. Like, uh, you know, he had that, um, he just about uh, ended up giving up the game. And, um, you know, that was maybe the worst because he got the win, mm-hmm. um, but it was just so defeating at the same time, right? Oh, nice. I, I do have tickets for the um, the 13th game on the 13th. Uh, I don't miss. Uh, I go down. I go, uh, go down. Go up to Edmonton for Battle of Alberta games, almost a guarantee, and I come to them, uh, watch them here. So that's the one. Um, that's like my oh, okay. every year. I mean, when you don't <laughs> yeah. have much to cheer for when we're not making the playoffs – uh, that's my Stanley Cup. If we can win that, <laughs> if we can win that series, uh, I'm happy. And you know what? If if we can sweep the, if we sweep the Flames for a second straight year because they haven't lost them in two years, that would be unbelievable. Yeah. And not only that, two wins against the Flames this month would probably kill whatever playoff hopes they have left. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and uh, that wouldn't make me sad in the least. <laughs> No. How many games do you usually go to a year total? Uh, I probably see, uh, at minimum, I see a half dozen. Okay. Uh, So a fair bit. I I usually try to get out to, um, unfortunately, I was at that Sabres game uh, near the end of January. Um, I try to get to Edmonton for a minimum of four or five games. Okay. And then I will watch them in Calgary, which is at least two games. Okay. I, I mean, know. I try to get to uh, Edmonton about, I'd say three, four times a year. Uh, for And most of the time it is for games. I, I do go for like that play on tournament that they have, uh, uh, the street hockey tournament every summer, but other than, yeah, yeah, uh, and they're not having it this year. <laughs> Disappointing. <laughs> they're looking for a sponsor too. So, um, yeah, but other than that, I, I try to get out there uh, for about three games a year, and uh, I've only been to one this year. And unfortunately, that was the New Year's Eve game against Winnipeg, where they got absolutely destroyed. <laughs> and I was w- I was with a Jets fan. Yeah, well, we're you <laughs> yeah. are batting the same. But uh, yeah, I hopefully hopefully you can. Uh, be a good luck charm and have uh, have the Oilers keep that winning record against the Flames going because that would be great. <laughs> oh, you know, there is nothing sweeter than being in the Saddle Dome uh, the last two years uh, and the Oilers coming in and uh, putting the game away early yeah. and uh, looking next to you and, and the Flames fan and their sad <laughs> Calgary Flames jerseys. and <laughs> You know, I've, I've, only, I, I love I've only ever been to one Battle of Alberta. And it was the year that they went, that the Oilers went to the the final in 06. Uh, yeah. What's it, what's it like at, at the dome? Cause I've been to the dome about 
eight times, I think, but it's always been for junior hockey. I, uh, I'm just curious, like, what is it? Is it a is it a different vibe there than uh, at uh, Rogers Place? Because yeah, there's got to be a, a certain amount of Oilers fans surrounding you, right? Yeah. So uh, you know. Eh, eh, Despite what Flames fans would like to believe, yeah. outside of Calgary, the majority of Albertans are Oilers fans. And I would love to say that's, you know, because we're the better team. Uh, we know as of late that that's not been the case. The reality is, is uh, during the glory years, uh, if you didn't live in Calgary, um, and you weren't already cheering for another NHL team, uh, you were cheering for the Oilers. I mean, they had Gretzky yeah. and Messier. And, and so, you know, places like Lethbridge are full of Oilers fans. Um, you know, Medicine Hat. Lloyd Minster was too. Yeah. I, I saw that. I mean, that's not yeah, too Lloyd. far away either. Isn't Red Deer, Red Deer's kind of the cutoff? Yeah, I, Red, I Red, Deer is, Red Deer's funny. Red Deer's about 50-50, but uh, most, of the, um, okay. most of the other cities and towns, even south of Calgary, are, are full of Oilers fans. So when you go no way. when you go to um Rogers Place uh and then yeah. even when it was at Rexall and you go to an Oilers Flames game, a Battle of Alberta yeah. game, there's going to be a few Flames fans there, but it's not you know, it's not a time. They don't travel as well as Oilers fans. Yeah, no, they don't. And um for instance, last year at the Battle of Battle of Alberta games at the Dome, yeah. uh it was there was one game uh, the one where we were winning, I don't know. It felt like we were up seven nothing by you know the second period. Oh yeah, that was. I don't remember. It was what. it was six one. Uh, Maroon scored early in the third period to make it six one, and then the Flames came back and clawed back to make it six five. And I was just thinking, oh man, if they if they blow a five goal lead in the, in the, in the, in the third period. <laughs> Then I'm ready to I'm ready to write their playoffs hopes off for the year. That was still when they had a shot. Well, and so that game uh, and a couple of the others have felt almost like fifty fifty. Okay, uh, Oilers fans and Flames fans. So it is like you can hear the Oilers fans cheering in the stands. Now it's not it's not fifty fifty. Yeah, it's just that Oilers fans Being loud. Uh, are loud and as great as we are. There's a number of assholes too. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> You know, I think that's the, you know, it's like uh, Leafs fans, right? Yeah. There's so many of them that there's bound to be some assholes, right? Um, but, um, you know, yeah. it's it's great. It's a good atmosphere. It's fun. The first, when the Flames used yeah. to beat the Oilers, which no. wasn't that long ago, um, it was, it could get rough. There were some rude Flames fans. Uh, but, you know, I don't fault them. It, there, it, there's course. rude fans in every league or every, every city. Uh, and... I mean, look, Edmonton has some too. Look what happened in McDavid last week with the heckling, right? <laughs> that's, that's so unreal, isn't although, it? Although I don't, I don't consider those guys fans, though. That's the only thing. Yeah, no, they're not. And for the most part, right? Like I've, um, I've gone to Battle of Alberta games with uh, friends that are Flames fans, right? Uh, and um, you know, it's fun. I love the rivalry. I, you know, yeah. I hate the Flames uh, more than I hate any other team, uh, but. You know, I don't expect, and I live in Calgary, I don't expect Flames fans to love the Oilers. No. In fact, I don't ever want them to cheer for the Oilers. <laughs> it's a rivalry, right? And that's what makes it great and fun. And if you're respectful to other fans, uh, that's the best, you know, it's fun. Now, we're, right? we're probably going to be biased on this, but do you think that the oil that Oiler fans have a healthier respect for when the Flames accomplish something than when the than Flames fans do for the Oilers? Like case in point, I'm just thinking of a couple of times like when McDavid had a four goal night, when Ben Scrivens makes 59 saves, when Sam Gagne gets eight points. I mean, I was in Calgary for some of those moments, and I feel like you know the Flames fans wanted to give. No props to the Oilers at all for any any good accomplishment, even during the de- decade of darkness, like when we were just clinging to these, you know, few bright moments that were something to look forward to in the season. Uh, but I feel like when Aguila scored 50 goals, I mean, 
that you know like we would oiler fans would be like, yeah, oh, that's like a good one, right yeah, yeah that was like a good yeah. accomplishment i just feel like being in calgary do you do you feel like that's that's the case that that it's harder for the that flames fans to say anything nice about the oilers than it is for oiler fans to say anything nice about the flames i you know i think that just comes with you know uh the success the oilers have had yeah and and uh, it's got to be tough for Flames fans, and and I'm not saying this to you know be the asshole. Uh, I just it, that's the way it is. In fact, you know, like um, when the Oilers were in the decade of darkness yeah. and prior to McDavid's years, I got razzed all the time. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, we stayed fans okay. uh, as Oilers fans. We 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 came through that. Uh, but guys would give me you know the gears. Um, and so last year when the Oilers made it back into the playoffs, I didn't give those same Flames fans mm-hmm. the gears. I didn't, uh, you know what? I acted like I'd been there before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, uh, and, um, you know, I still haven't. And, and I'm thankful I didn't because this year, <laughs> <You're right back. laughs> this year they'd probably, be. but they, this year has been a, a definite change. Yeah. They, I haven't, uh, people don't razz me anymore, even though the Oilers aren't but doing you know well. What? The Flames, um, are, are they really that better of a hockey team? They, they're, the Oilers are averaging, I think, more goals per game than Flames are averaging. And really, wh- how many wins do the Flames have this year? 33, and the Oilers have 29. They're four wins better than us at this point. If it wasn't for their 10 overtime losses, they would, they would be in the same spot that the Oilers are in right now. So... I don't think that the, that there's that big of a difference between the two teams at this point. Really, it could all change next season with a couple of moves for the Oilers. We could surpass them again. And I'm not just saying that because I'm an Oilers fan. I really believe that the teams are closer than Flames fans are making it out to be right now. Yeah, and I and to be fair, I haven't. Um, they haven't razzed me a lot. Uh... Uh, recently i mean they're still they've got they've played an extra game they're three points back uh they're you know their last 10 games they've been uh borderline awful um it's not looking good for them uh and they they have a you know they have to jump a couple of teams to just to make it right so you know at this time of the year i think uh what there's 14 games left um you know, it's going to be a hard, hard uh, job for them to uh, do well. The Oilers, if they oh, yeah. um, if they win, and and uh, I I think we'll see a, a Flames team that is uh, as motivated to win this game on Tuesday as we've ever seen. Or uh, yeah, Tuesday. Um, well, it's it, they're fighting for their yeah. lives right now, and a regula- a regulation loss would absolutely crush them right now <laughs> but i you know what mcdavid just plays better when it's the flames so um i won't uh he, he'll you know you said it earlier he puts the team on his back and and uh yeah. you know he'll remind me again uh just how great he is i'm sure i'm looking uh, forward to that yeah 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 <laughs> he's fun you know he is so fun to watch live isn't he like yeah. i was at that game the first game of the year this year uh, when I was uh, booking my Stanley Cup uh, ticket, <laughs> um, <laughs> that changed quickly. Uh, but I remember as soon as he got the puck on that goal that he went end to end. I was I I just had this feeling, and if and if you're watching on TV or if you're at the game, you just knew it's like kinetic energy. Mm-hmm. You saw him put the legs uh, under him. And you just knew he was going end to end. Uh, that's still, you know, to me, that's the speed that he has. Um, and who what, he beat Brody on that play, yeah, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. And, and Brody is no slouch. That that kid oh, uh, is fast, right? Like as, as did far as D men go, last he's year fast. and this year, he's schooled Drew Doughty on one on one experience on one on one situations. So that. Yeah. Well, hopefully he can have a three or four point <laughs> night on uh, Tuesday so, and uh, be a big Battle of Alberta win for us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I think we'll, um, you know, uh, call it a night tonight. But uh, before we go, what um, what do you got lined up? Are you got any uh, articles that we can uh, look forward to uh, on Oil on White or uh, any articles, past articles that uh, yeah, I, you suggest I should, we might I should, go see? 
for sure. You know, I just started uh, r- writing for them again. I had taken a couple months off because I was very focused on my uh, internship at uh, Newcap Television in Lloydminster. So I didn't have as much time to contribute as I normally would have. So uh, now that I'm finished with that and in the job search, uh, I'm currently uh, writing a little bit more now. You can expect that. And uh, I, I don't have a, a new one planned at the moment. I was hoping to put something out uh, about the draft, but I think that that'll be put on hold a little while longer, at, at least closer to the lottery draft. So uh, I should have a new article out within, you know, the next few days. Anyway, I, I aim to do one or two a week. So yeah, I, I appreciate you uh, giving me a little promotion there. And uh, it was a, a lot of fun to come do this. Uh, I'm a fan of the podcast and hopefully we can do this again. Yeah, no, we'll, we definitely will do this again. Uh, awesome. So for those of you that don't know, you can find Eric Friesen on Twitter at Eric J. Friesen, mm-hmm. uh, F-R-I-E-S-E-N. Uh, he also writes on uh, at oilonwhite.ca. His most uh, recent article is uh, about putting Nuge on the wing with Connor McDavid, which uh, yeah. we finally saw tonight. Yeah, Hopefully so. we see a little bit more uh, during the last half of the season uh it was great yeah i really enjoyed having you on and uh, i had you on because um (laughs) you know we all have uh, people on twitter that comment a lot and do a lot of different things uh always uh really respect um the analysis you bring to the game i don't uh i personally i don't um uh say that uh, i'm the the best analyst but uh, i learn a lot from you uh guys like ruel guys like sean kelly you know i I think we all learn from each other uh honestly like there's things that you know certain guys say like kelly has such good insight on the ohl you know or not uh, sean does kelly you know he's i've written for his blog before too and uh you know he's a guy who has a lot of insight as well i i think that there's a lot of oiler fans that are that have different opinions they can learn from on Twitter. And yeah, it's, it's just always great to connect with you guys and kind of chat with talk. Absolutely. So uh, again, really appreciate you being in here. Uh, have a great night tonight and uh, let's hope for uh, some more Oiler wins down the stretch. Thank you. Yeah. We'll talk to you next time. Yeah.